I want to I want to pray um, for myself this morning that uh, yeah that God would move dear Heavenly Father I pray that your will might be done in revealing yourself to us. Lord, we just thank you that we have scripture. You have not left us in the dark. And there are things that are very, very difficult to understand. But you haven't left yourself silent. And Lord, so we strive to understand things that are very often beyond us, things that don't make sense. And we ask that your spirit open up our eyes so that we might see you clearly and be motivated by what we see um, and live our life in that, to live godly lives. So Lord, I just ask that you make my words clear and uh, make them fruitful. And I pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. So we're back in Second Peter. And um, we're going to be dealing with a, a passage or a subject that is, I don't know, it's, it's uh, um, lots of arguments over some passages, lots of disagreements of, of how to take things and so on. Um, but I'll do my best to, uh, to, to make things as clear from my point of view as I can. So, uh, 2 Peter, and I'm going to read the passages that we dealt with uh, last week. So, if you remember... Um, Peter calls us to, to uh, he says that God has given us through his power everything we need to live a godly life. And then he lists these, these things that we're supposed to be trying to do, these list, this list of attributes um, starting with faith and, and then moving through these, uh, as these attributes. And they're not actions, they're, they're, they're from within us. And then he says this in verse 8 and 9. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. But if anyone does not have them, he is nearsighted and blind and has forgotten that he has been cleansed from his past sins. Now we talked about this maturing process and how we are all supposed to be, no matter where we are at with our relationship with Christ, we are supposed to be growing. We are supposed to be maturing. And Peter has pointed out in a number of times already in this passage that it is the knowledge of Jesus Christ that causes that. It is knowing God, not knowing about God, but knowing God that gives us the power um, to have peace and grace. And now uh, he takes this... Um, this idea, and he kind of jags off in a in a, a different direction. So, First Peter one, ten to eleven. Therefore, my brothers, be all the more eager to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never fall, and you will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So, um, just as it attaches itself to the previous thoughts, 
uh, it is about what God has done. God has given us everything we need, but it is all also about our effort. The things we do to, to make sure that we're growing, the striving. And in, in, in this passage, it reflects the eagerness. Therefore, my brothers, be all the more eager to make your calling. Do you see that there, there's our part of the equation here? Uh, but this statement, that it causes so much problems because he, he says, make sure your calling and election, oh, make your calling and election sure. Now, there's been hundreds of years of argument over, over uh, how we understand the cosmos works. Um, over the subject of free will and the, and the control of God over events. So I'm going to give you, in, in, a, in a very quick way, my, my take on this. Free will means that we have the ability to make choices. Free will is based on the idea that you have the ability to make a choice. And how do you make choices? We are sinners, and so our cho choices are, are made from a sinful nature. There's this idea in our culture um, and, and this gets attached to politics, that we are basically good. We are good creatures. We, we mess up, and our mess ups are largely due to our ignorance. We don't know enough, and so on. And we, as a culture, rely on science to answer our questions. And right now, um, <clears throat> there is, uh, a lot of weight put on science to form our ideas about the the universe. Christianity says no, that's not right. We are limited in um, because we are we are sinful. We are broken inside. So it's not just that we're we're ignorant. So a lot of politics is uh, progressive. And uh, that sounds good, and it is good. Uh, but the assumption is that mankind can be perfectible. Mankind can improve. And we look at the past and we see that there, there are a lot of things in our culture that have improved. And we turn a blind eye to the things in our culture that have gone sour. We are not perfectible apart from what God does in us. That's the Christian point of view. Now in that, God reveals himself to all mankind, but it is in our nature to reject him. It is in our very nature, in our, well, uh, um, in our makeup that we reject God. And uh, we say, we say no to God because we are unable to say yes to God. And uh, that's important to understand how the biblical, biblical concept of being bound, being in a place where, where we're, we're in chains of sins. And it affects our decision making, it affects all these things and um, 
And then all of a sudden, for some people, God suddenly moves in us and we cannot help but say yes to him. That is God's part. And that is the calling and election of God. John describes this calling. Uh, and the imagery is, is great here. The one, uh, John 10, 2 and, uh, to 4. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and lead them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them, and his feet, sheep follow him because they know his voice. The problem for us is that we can't understand because God does not call everyone. And I want you to grasp this because it is the basis for how special you are if you have been called by God. You are his chosen ones. And, and that uh, concept of being chosen by God is all throughout scripture. God does not elect everyone. We cannot respond to God until God breaks the chains that binds our hearts and frees us to follow. There, there is so much to say on this topic that it, it, it uh, I can only just sort of barely touch on it. And, um, and there's all sorts of arguments about how much free will we have and, and you know, we're, we're not robots, we're not automatons, we, we don't just blindly follow, but there's, there's, there's something in there, this struggle for, for making this make sense in our world. Partly because we experience choice making. If, if, uh, if, if I asked you to come up here and tell your story, there would be a story to tell about how you became a Christian about the process and the decision, the, 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 the step you made or the series of steps that you made. So we experience uh, decision making and it's very difficult to, to, for us to, to grasp the concept that, that we didn't really have a choice. So we have our perspective and we have God's perspective. God's perspective says that if you are a follower of Christ, your name was in the book of life before the foundation of the world. That's amazing, but it's not something that we relate to well. And this problem, is when we, when we hear about calling and election, it doesn't always match our own experience because people think, well, I was good enough to, you know, I worked through this in my head and I thought about it and I experienced this and that. Um, we have this experience and it, it doesn't feel like we're being dragged along. Actually, for some people it does. I don't believe I had that much of a choice. I had grown up accepting God, but uh, I, I wasn't, uh, I was, I guess, a believer, but not a follower till I was in my early 20s. And then all of a sudden, God moved, and um, I, I couldn't help but follow him. See, it's, it's we decide, we make a choice, we experience salvation. 
And if you look back on your life, you can see the process of this decision making. And so we do not relate to this idea that God elected us. We relate more to us electing God. Is that not right? We reached out and we found God and we pulled him in. And God says, no, no. I reached down and I selected you because I loved you while you were still a sinner, while you were still ignorant, while you were still living your own life. I reached down and I touched your life instead of us trying to reach up. We also relate to the struggles of that decision. The doubts, the questions, the distractions. After we have made that decision, it's still a process. The fact that our faith so often goes cold, we start to question our salvation. Was, you know, my experience says I'm doubting. Uh, but God says that he elected me. And we're, so not, we're not saved by being good or passionate. And we might have come to the conclusion that um, if you're a hyper-Calvinist, if any of you know what that means, uh, that you can't lose your salvation because it's not based on works. So I can do anything I like, and because I'm elected, I'm, I'm good, I'm good, I'm saved. Not only that, but my, my, uh, my son at the age of five uh, said that he loved Jesus, so we immediately got him baptized and he's in now. And yes, he's a drug dealer, and yes, he's living a life of dissipation, but that doesn't matter because he's saved. Peter say, is saying here that if you want to be sure of your salvation, all you need to do is mature as a Christian. Now, remember last week I was saying that you know, if, if, if you had a child um, and at the, um, at the age of eight, they're still not able to speak, there's a problem. You take them to a de developmental uh, doctor and, and they do all sorts of tests because there's something wrong. And the, the problem is that uh, we expect growth to happen. It's, it's like a requirement. If you're going to grow into an adult, then there's certain things that are expecting, expected of you. But if you're still acting as a child, then that's a problem. We don't expect the same thing from a new Christian as we do from somebody who has been around for a long time. We expect somebody who is a mature Christian to be active, to be producing fruit, to be a servant of God, to be uh, teaching others, to be doing all these things. But if you don't have any of that drive in you, then you got a question, well, am I growing? And if I'm not growing, why am I not growing? The key to making your calling and election um, sure is in watching yourself grow and watching other people grow and striving and trying and failing and getting up and doing it again. Remember that Peter says that it is our knowledge of God that gives us the power to live a godly life. It is the godly life that is evidence of a saved heart. And if you're not living a god, godly life, then you're not making your calling and election sure. 
It is the godly life that is evidence of a saved heart. We are to produce fruit. It's not a request. It's a command. It's, uh, it's a little bit like um, we're, we're built as adults to have jobs, to take care of ourselves, to take care of others. And uh, if you're... If a guy is sitting in his parents' basement at the age of 45 and just playing and has never worked a day in his life, he's not producing fruit. He's not doing what he was created to do, which is work and provide and grow and learn. Matthew 3.10 the axe is already at the fruit of the trees, and every tree that does not produce fruit, good fruit, will be cut down and thrown into the fire. Ooh, ouch. That's what's at stake here. Jesus here, in this context, is talking about these religious leaders who believe totally that they're producing fruit. They are the spiritual leaders of Israel. They are the ones that know. And they are faced with this stern warning. Your religion, your religiosity, your ability to obey all the rules and to make people also obey all those rules. They're nothing. The writer of Hebrews gives us a, a, a similar message. So Hebrew, Hebrews 6, uh, verses 7 to 9. The land that drinks in the rain often falling on it. The land that drinks in the rain often falling on it. And it produces a crop useful to those for whom it has been that it is farmed, receives the blessing of God. But the land that produces thorns and thistles is worthless and is in danger of being cursed. In the end, it will be burned. But then he goes on. Even though we speak like this, dear friends, we are confident of better things in your case, things that accompany salvation. But do you see here, that the things that accompany salvation, the things that are supposed to be with salvation are, are fruit, being fruitful. P Peter is going to go on in, in, in 2 Peter um, saying some really serious things about those who do not grow. Um, and if you get a chance to read the rest of this letter, you will read some, some incredibly stern warnings. So how are we to get to the point where we can just rest in our salvation? Um, how can we make our calling and election certain for us in our own minds. And I want to go back to a statement I made a few weeks ago. The key to all this, all this, this living a godly life, insecurity and all this, is knowing God. And that knowing involves a relationship. And all relationships work the same way. They take work. They take uh, effort and uh, you know it, it, we, when we look at all the relationships like a marriage if you don't work at it you lose it even if you do work at it sometimes you lose it because it has to be both ways but to ignore a marriage to act like you're not marriage uh means you're probably not really married, not in the way that God intended. And families work the same way. Parents 
do not give up on their children, but children can remove themselves from a relationship with their parents. And you think, well, okay, but they're still parents. Well, yeah, but the benefits of that aren't there. The benefits of, of, uh, of, uh, uh, of the relationship aren't there. When you're at home and you're having your kids around you and you're enjoying a relaxing evening and everything, uh, it, it feels healthy, it feels good, it feels the way it should be. In that context, you do not fear losing their relationship. If you have that relationship, if you're working at it and spending time on it and everything, there's really nothing to fear. When you're traveling around with your spouse and enjoying each other and secure in their love, you do not fear about losing that relationship. You have confidence in it. If it's tried and true, if it has gone through trials and tribulations, and you don't fear the loss of it. Even when arguments happen and, and hurt and anger, these things, if, if there is a solid relationship, don't endanger that relationship. We can all have all sorts of struggles and we can have failures in our walk with God. We can have doubts and anger with God, but if God is ignored, then the relationship will, will disappear. You can't say that you have a relationship simply because you go to church or that you acknowledge that God exists or whatever. The Pharisees, were like that. They believed in God. They tried so hard to, to follow the rules and to be saved. And yet God, uh, Jesus is brutally honest with them. You don't know God. You don't know God. You don't have a relationship with him. If God is ignored, then there is no relationship and maybe there was not a relationship in the first place. And this, this happens to people who grow up in Christian homes where it's just expected that they believe. They're, they're Christians because they obeyed mommy and daddy and believed what uh, they told them. But everybody comes into this relationship as an individual. So salvation is about being brought to a point where we have this relationship with God. Relationship is what we were created to have with God. That's the meaning of life right there. If anybody asks you, what's the meaning of life? It's to, it's to, to have this relationship with God and to enjoy it. So, we are to make our calling and election sure. And it's amazing because Peter tells us that we have everything we need to live a godly life and to prove that our calling and election is sure. Make every effort to grow and watch as God produces fruit in your life and, and brings joy to your life through that relationship that outlasts all the pain and suffering and failures that we go through. Calling and election. 
the fact that we are called, that we are elected, should make you so aware of the grace of God. Just the concept that God reached down and, and loved you enough to die for you, loved you enough to reach down and touch your life. You are special. You are chosen. You are elected. That is amazing. Because when we look around us, we see millions of people who don't have that advantage. And that opens up a whole other can of worms. But um, I think we need to rejoice in that. I think we need to rejoice in the fact that through no fault or uh, of our own, through no uh, goodness of our own or, or wisdom of our own, God chose us and decided that that's the person that I want to send my Holy Spirit to fill up. And eventually that person will be exactly, exactly what I created them to be. Dear Heavenly Father, help us to understand your love for us. Help us to strive for the relationship. And may that striving and that relationship make us people who others would desire to be. We are called to be witnesses to everyone. We're called to explain this to everyone and those whom you have already chosen will respond like sheep who hear a voice. They will respond. Not necessarily to our voice, but to your voice. Lord, uh, in this community, May our lights shine in a way that those people who will listen, who have ears to hear, would respond and be saved. Lord, I pray this in the mighty power of your name. Amen.